Welcome everybody. I'm Josh Friedman with One Zero Digital Media and I'm really excited to be here today with Joanna Steidel, whose artwork I have been following for quite a few years now. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to her about what she does with drones and drone photography and drone videography. So welcome, Joanna. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Josh. So first of all, where are you today? Where do you live? Um, I am in Southampton, New York. So I'm on the east end of Long Island. Um, I'm about three miles from the ocean and a mile from the bay. Awesome. And professionally speaking, what, how would you describe what you do with drones? Well, I would say that um, I'm a content creator and an artist. So um, basically, I sell my photography as high-end fine art, um, try to print large scale. And um, I license a lot of my videography um, and turn to news sources, um, National Geographic, BBC, uh, travel companies around the world, um, uh, documentary filmmakers, and stuff like that. Yeah, and I think that I would consider you a little bit unique in the drone world in that a lot of us who are doing a lot of commercial work um, you know, for me, it's not just about pretty pictures. It's oftentimes I'm taking pictures of roofs that are being inspected. I'm taking pictures of construction sites, you know, that obviously need to look pretty, but, you know, nobody's printing these and hanging them on their walls. And you have been, I think, very successful in being able to really stick to being an artist and creating art. Um, what are some of the themes to your art, to, to what you're creating with drones? Well, let me just rewind one second there. It didn't start out that way, Josh. I did, I put my toe into everything. I mean, I, I tried real estate, I did construction, I do some progressive videos of uh, some flower fields and stuff I got to do this year. Um, so uh, I don't really enjoy doing that. I really love the art. Um, and some of the things, I mean, everything depends on the weather, you know, for me. Um, so, um, I, I mainly focus now on marine life and either top down abstracts or, you know, I really like shadow play, anything that is different and unique. Like I, I don't want to put out something that's similar to somebody else in any way. And I think that's really challenging to do for most people. I think that, um, from what I've seen of your work though, most of your work reflects um, what's happening in your community as far as the nature. Um, you know, I live in Southern California, so weather is something that we don't really consider almost ever. Uh, we're just not thinking about the weather here because it's pretty much the same almost every day, although there's clouds in my sky today, but they're gonna go away by two o'clock. Um, but where you are, you have marine life, um, and then you also have four seasons a year, you know, and, and, and I feel like that's kind of, you know, what, what's drawing you to all of that when you're capturing photos and videos with drones? I think the main philosophy for me is that um, I fly a lot. So um, I fly, like I'm not flying today, but I fly almost every good day. Um, I did that for many, many years in this area. So I got to learn what spots I like in the spring, what areas I like in the winter for snow. Um, with snow, I like like kind of cascading layers and different heights, and we're pretty flat here. So finding those little spots is great. And in the summer, all I do is fly the ocean, <laughs> you know, pretty much over the ocean every day. And um, so we're living in an area here where the uh, conservation efforts have gone into effect um, and back at about 10 years ago. And now the coastline is just booming with fish. I mean, tens to hundreds of thousands of fish in a school. And we've got, we've got whales, and tons of different sharks, rays, dolphins, seals. So, um, you know, and it's an experience that, you know, we never saw here. I grew up here, so we never saw a whale. And now you can go down the beach and, and they'll be like literally 20 feet in front of you. So, um, so I wanted to, to focus on the marine life because number one, I love being at the beach. Number two, um, it's, uh, you know, it's very plentiful here in the summer months. Um, but you know, like I said, I, you have to, I, I could fly all day, every day for 10 days and not get, not get anything or maybe a five second clip that I like. 
No, so it's, I, I tell people, you know, they say, how do you do it? And I said, I fly all the time. So the more you fly, the better chances you have of getting something great, you know? So, so basically I, I just kind of learned my landscape and it's, you know, the landscape and geology is changing all the time. So, um, you know, every year it looks different. Um, you know, the foliage, uh, you know, having looked back at my foliage photos and I'll share one with you, um, a vibrant speckled way. Um, I, I, I've shot the same location every year for, I don't know, three or four years. And it looks like very different every time because, you know, the weather conditions that turn the leaves, you know, it could be a ton of, ton of wind and there's no leaves, you know, a lot less leaves, a lot less color. So, so it's a, it's a matter of, um, you know, just fly, fly as often as you can take notes. Um, when I take the drone up, I do a 360 video. I mean, I don't anymore, but I used to, because that way when I got home, I could really study it very closely. And I would find these small little like gems that, you know, if I hadn't turned the drone around, I never would have noticed it. Or sometimes the sky behind you is just beautiful, you know, and I often do it at the beach too, even though over the ocean, I always stop and like, you know, check everything out. Isn't it, isn't it a great feeling when you like, you're flying over something and like you, you decide, oh, let's see what the top down looks like. And you just bring the camera straight down and all of a sudden you see some perspective of something and you're like, wow, I had wow. no idea that's what it was going to look like. And, you know, yeah. I appreciate the fact that you're sharing that, you know, some days you go out a week plus and you're not going to, you know, you don't get what you're looking for. Because from my perspective, I just see your work all the time. I'm like, wow, she's, you know, seeing whales every single day of her life and sharks and rays. You know, this is amazing. Like, they must just be like frolicking in her backyard, you know. Um, <laughs> well, I, you know, honestly, I had over 10,000 shark photos. Wow. I'm down to 345. That's amazing. And you're so, flying um, mostly from the shore, right? You're not on a boat, you're I'm not flying, out there? Yeah, I flew from a boat a couple of times, but um, you know, I uh, next year I'll have the uh, drone that's easy to hand launch and land. Right, yeah. You know, because the ocean is rough, and you know, on a smaller boat, very difficult to hand launch and land a Mavic 3. Plus, it's gonna mess with the warranty, so I'd rather not do that. Yeah, we've I've been flying. It, but the uh, the Inspire series for a long time, and there are actually handles that you can get for the Inspire Two, uh, which we fly, and um, it's a, a little bit risky. I won't lie, um, but I'll have an assistant. He'll wear you know protective gear, hand, you know gloves and everything, and um, it still takes a lot of teamwork and communication in order to successfully land the drone because the boat is moving up and down in addition to side to side, forward yes. and back, yeah. while you're trying to bring the drone in. And early on, I, I had a really challenging situation. I have the I have a video of this actually. I'll I'll see if I can share it. But um, I was trying to land a drone on a boat that had a hot tub on the back. A yacht, I shouldn't say, but it was a okay. good sized yacht. And the hot tub's there. And there's about four four or five people sitting behind me watching me try to land. And it was an overhang, so I had to bring the drone into the boat, kind of under the overhang, and land on the hot tub. Well, because of the vertical movements of the boat, the drone wouldn't sit. The props just would not turn turn off. Yeah. And it took me about six tries. And I had no idea they were filming, you know? And like, you know, it's one of those moments your adrenaline's going, going, going. But, you know, I've had enough flight experience that I knew each time, just bring it back out. I can't hit anything once I'm over the ocean, you know? And then bring it back in, try again. And I finally landed it. And in my mind, I'm like, nailed it. But <laughs> like, it took a while. So yeah. now we, we, again, I have an assistant. I have the handles. Um, yeah. We always hand launch and hand catch off of boats. Um, but it's a lot safer to do it from land if you can. So that's awesome. Yeah, and, and I can. So part of what you're doing, you're winning awards. You know, you're you're taking your art and you're submitting it to different things. Um, how is it helping you? And what are some of the different festivals that you're you're submitting your work to? Oh, you know what? It's it's really. Um, I think it's one of the the biggest influences in my success. So. Um, you you know I was in um, California. I think uh, California Drone Film Festival was really the first one I ever entered. Um, that and uh, Thunderbird Drone Film Festival is here. This year I entered Arizona Film Festival. Um, now those are all kind of uh, United States, even though they they go international. Um, but then I started doing a little bit uh, more established. Um, ones like the Sienna Awards, the Sienna Drone Awards. Um, 
And that, I had three pieces in this year. I, uh, first, I'm going to tell you that what, what happened is, is the very first year I entered, um, you know, they wanted the raw image. And, you know, I made the short list and they want the raw image. I don't keep that. You know, oh, man, I tell you what, I was like, okay, we need to, like, learn something about organization of the files, you know, how to, you know, properly name change, name everything and keep them in a special hierarchy of and not throw out your raw images ever, <laughs> so, just in case. Um, so, uh, but this year I had I had three pieces that went in. I had um, I had streaming, which is a shot of a uh, a surfer, and we don't have big waves here. It just happened, and that was a runner up in the sport category. But it just so happened, it was a great moment, and I. You know, I worked with it in the edit. You know, it's it was probably one of those photos because the water here is really brown. I mean, it looks brown and murky. It looks beautiful blue from the side, but top down, it is brown. Speckled way, the one I told you about um, in the thing. And then I had paving way, a shark one. And the Sienna Awards was really huge for me because I got published in all over the world. I was published in Forbes magazine and like-minded magazines all around the world. So that set in motion, um, you know, names like National Geographic and certain other high-end organizations to contact me for those photos. Um, so that was a really big one. Um, it's nice when they're reaching out to you, isn't it? <laughs> well, you, you know, it, it's great. I always love it. I always get real excited. And, you know, until that check's in my hand, I don't really believe it. You know what I mean? I just don't, you know, because cause there's been, oh, you know, a lot of times they'll just go, what is the pricing on this? You know, we're interested in a book cover. And, you can, you know, and it just, you know, but those types of things take a really long time. So, um, so the Sienna Awards was, I, I mean, it was huge. I was also in um, Reporters Without Borders. 100 images around the world this year, which they just reached out to me out of the blue for diving, which is one of my whale photos. And um, I actually ended up being a small piece on the back cover of the book. I mean, it's a big, beautiful book. I was like, wow, this is, it was pretty exciting. And so now with the Reporters Without Borders, now that they took my photo and that went on exhibit through England. Now, Sienna Awards, that got three images um, in the Tuscany exhibit above us, only sky. So that was big. And one of the main things in terms of the art for me is to get my work printed in front of people. You know, because uh, you can look at it digitally but no gallery owner is going to look at something digitally and say, oh, yes, we want that. Mm. You have to have that printed. You need a portfolio. You know, you need to have established, um, uh, you know, your work in different settings. I think so, that a lot of people miss out on that part, too. I think a lot of us, you know, because we're so used to the digital files, everything goes on social media, everything goes online, you know. And I know for me, like, I love seeing my art printed, you know, and and again we do all kinds of things with one zero digital media but you know throughout the 13 years now of you know flying with drones i've created a number of art photos that i have no intention of selling that just you know i have them and they're either hanging in my house or or it's also fun for me to go to a client's office and you know we maybe we'll do um, an aerial shot of their building and there it is printed on a huge canvas and my, my biggest gallery ever was in newport beach california i was shooting pictures of a construction project um called the airy project and they had put a fencing around the entire property to do the construction and they okay. printed my photos to go on the fence and they were there for like two and a half three years you know and every time you know and i would see people you know stopping by and looking at what the aerial perspective looked like and this was early on when drones like you know very few people were flying drones and we you know we had the phantom 2 the original phantom 2 taking pictures and then they're blowing it up and putting it on the fence and I would joke, you know, oh, yeah, this is my gallery. Look, these are my images right here, you know. But it's, it is fun. I think it's important for um, drone pilots to just print things sometimes and just have it in print so people can see it on display. It is. It's neat. And, and you know, my first, uh, we have a library here. I went to my library. I signed up. And I, I did a whole solo show in their gallery. 
just it didn't cost me a dime. I mean, I had to, I put out the money for the prints and everything. Yeah. But it was it was you know, it was it's good. It's always good to have a nice solo show too. I've been in a bunch of group exhibits and everything. Um, so this year, uh, we also had the whalebone photo contest, which is not really too well known. Whalebone is a very high end magazine out here between Montauk and New York City. And I entered because the grand prize was 6000 I said, you know what? I don't want to do these contests I have to pay for anymore. <laughs> Let's do the big ones that do the prizes. And um, my photo, Another World, was uh, which also won Southern California this year um, and Arizona this year, was a runner-up in Whalebone. So that was... Uh, what did the runner-up get? If the winner got 6000 did the runner-up get anything but a handshake? I got 500. That's lovely. <laughs> yeah. But I also was, oh, the Sky Pixel contest. That was another big one. I mean, I, I was baffled. I had a shark and um, an image called See Me. Mm -hmm. um, that, that came in like 12th in the photos for the year. I just I couldn't believe it. So, I mean, so surprised. Right. Shot, totally shocked. I hadn't even been on Sky Pixels. I was only on there for like a month. Only to do the contest, and then so I won. Uh, I won an Osmo action with that one. Nice. And Sky Pixel, for those that don't know, is DJI's contest, so they give away their own prizes from DJI. Yeah. So, but it was also a, a great amount of exposure, and I got an invite to be a creator, and then I got accepted as a creator mm -hmm. um, this year. So that was really big. Tell me a little bit about your process. So I know that you have an image. I don't know the name of it. I apologize, but I believe it's storks that are flying. And um, again, I you know when I first saw that image, I had two thoughts. One was like, "Wow, what a coincidence that those birds were all there when she was flying." And then my second thought is how incredible that the shadowing and the lighting was just perfect like that, right? And then you and I had a conversation about it once, and I realized that that's my perception. Which is perfect because it's art and it's supposed to baffle people, right? That's what the definition in my mind of art is. It's, you know, making people look at something and wonder how was that created, right? Um, so tell me a little bit or tell us a little bit about what your process is. And I'll put this image up with the storks um, if you'll share it with me. And it's you, seagulls. Is, the parting, were they yeah, seagulls? The one, okay. Parting way, it's called Parting Ways. Yes. The one that was the SoCal. Yes. That was... So tell us about your process with that. How did the birds get there in the first place? <laughs> okay, so the birds are there because it's it's a bay and an ocean. So you have the bay on this side, and you have the ocean here. There's the ocean, here's the bay. There's only a little bit of sand in between. So so the, the seagulls are there every day. But I would go... Um, anyway, so it just so happened, it definitely doesn't look this way anymore. The way the... the um, when the tide goes out on the bay side, it leaves these veins. You know, you see these veins um, of different colored sands due to like the a mix of algae. You know, when it's draining out. So um, I really loved the sand, <laughs> and uh, I know there's seagulls there all the time. So I would go down. Um, I knew I, I knew I wanted to shot in golden hour morning as early as I could um, because um, I do believe this might have been taken during the California wildfires. When you guys had the wildfires, the smoke came out here and the sky was more red and orange and it put a whole mist over the sand. You know, so, um, so I went down with a couple of loaves of bread every day and I would take the drone up and I would watch, you know, depending on where the seagulls perches were, where they were hanging out. Once they go to one spot, they hang out. So I would throw the bread and I would just watch how the seagulls would, the seagulls would fly up and out and then down to get the bread. And then they fly really low away from me. So I just watched it over and over and over again. And I, yeah, I was at least 10 to 14 days. That I went down there and just just kept doing the bread, and they knew my car. By the time I pulled up, they were like ready for me, you know. 
all of it. So I often joke about people. It only costs me a few loaves of bread. But you're like their personal That's fast fun. food. Like you bring the yeah. food to them and then they, you know, they act as they do. And I think, again, to me, I was like, wow, I had no idea that you were feeding them. And that's partly, you know, how you had the scene as it was. Um, well, they were, they were, I would feed them to get them come to me because I wanted them to fly back over the, the specific section that had the veins. So wherever they were, I had to put the bread, you know, they would just fly back and forth. Like, so they didn't go somewhere else. They would go back and then they'd come to me to the bread and back. So I was able to like work it out, you know, anyway, you know, some of it is absolute luck, you know. Right, but also at the same time, you are making concerted effort to get the images, you know, that you're getting and you you can. (laughs) Um, talk to me about your editing process. What softwares do you use? Um, do you edit a lot? Do you feel like you edit a little bit? Um, what's your process look like? Not fun. No, I I, I really like to edit. Um, I spend a huge amount of time editing. Um, I don't put anything out. There. I mean, I just started doing a little bit of raw and edit on my social media because people are like, what? I mean, I think that's kind of where a little bit of my gift is. I come from a graphics background, so I did graphic design, website design, computer programming, and stuff like that. So, so uh, I didn't come from a photography background, so I don't really feel the need that my final piece has to be a true rendition of the photo I captured. I can make it whatever I want. You know, I can make a, the trees purple if I wanted, which is not going to look good in my opinion. But I do. I spend, I go through, um, what I do is, is I work in Photoshop and Lightroom first. I mean, so I had a Photoshop background and I did Photoshop with my photos for the first three or four years. Somebody said, well, you better learn Lightroom. I said, and you know, so that was a tough one. I I took a I took a year. I said I'm going to focus on learning this. Um, I love the photography. You know, I didn't love the real estate. I I said this is what I love. I, it took me a while to choose, but this is what I want to do. And so um, I do spend everything goes into Lightroom first. Basically, I shoot everything in DNG and RAW. I mean, in RAW and JPEG, um, just so I have them and. We have multiple hard drives, so we don't have to delete. You know, I usually go through everything. First run, I go through everything on the drive because there's definitely a lot that I can just trash before I even put it, you know, into Lightroom or whatever. So um, then I work with it in Lightroom and I have some presets and I have, you know, some things that, um, you know, work together well. And then it goes into Photoshop, and in Photoshop is when I can either really totally mess it up or uh, I can really make it nice, you know. So I found when I overdo things in Photoshop, um, because what I'll do is a lot of the marine life um, photos have tons of little white specks, air bubbles, and they're all over the place. And... If you're a realistic photographer, then that's great. That's fine. But I don't want that in my photos. <laughs> uh, you know, so I go through and I will literally stamp every single one out and inspect every single pixel. And, you know, I get to a point when I'm working on that photo and I'm working on a couple days or whatever. And I'm like all excited. I'm like, oh, this is great. And, and then I just put it away and I don't look at it for a day or two. And then I pull it back out and I'm like, oh, no, 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 let's, let's fix this. And, you know, so I go through that process and sometimes I'll leave photos for months at a time even because I just gave up on them. And I just recently went back to one I gave up on eight months ago and I came out, I just love it. You know what it is? I think the brain sometimes, it just needs that distancing. Yeah. Yeah. So when I wake when I wake up in one morning and I look at it and I said that's it it's done and I'm happy. But yes, I, I could spend days, weeks, 
I'm I call excited. it the fresh eyes. You know, you've got to look at something with yep. fresh eyes sometimes. And when you've been staring at the same image for, you know, an hour or two or three or four, you know, um, it does help. I think sometimes to just get away from it and come back to it. And you it know. does. It really helps. The other thing that I do, I often consider is um, I step up and I step back. I step away from the screen. So and, and I try to always think too, like, would this look good hanging on someone's wall? Mm hmm. Because there's so many photos that I take, like, oh, I wouldn't hang that on any wall, you know. But um, it's it's the other thing, too, which reminds me of um, the fact that just because I don't like it doesn't mean other people won't like it. Yes. So I'm really trying to open myself up to um, being a little more inclusive with my choices of what mm -hmm. I put out there. Yeah, as a photographer, especially I do portraitures and family photos sometimes, I always explain to the client, I'm going to give you more photos than you possibly would need. And some of them you're probably not going to like, you know, and others are you're going to you're going to have your mind blown, you know. But when it's pictures of others especially, um, I don't know what they're looking for. I don't know what they think is a great picture of themselves. I know what I think is a great photo, but sometimes my, I think is a great photo is because the lighting was perfect or there was something, the you know, the amount of blur in the background, the bokeh, the, you know, and it, my gosh, it's amazing. And then, you know, suddenly the client's like, but look at the, the face I was making. And I'm like, your face looks fine. I don't have any issues with this at all. And then they're like, oh, that's not the face I wanted to make, you know? So, um, yeah, we all view the art differently for sure. <laughs> And, I've um, had that happen to me too. It, yeah, it, definitely. I've done some wedding shoots, so I get hired by photographers um, to do some weddings and stuff. And I, I did this one wedding, and it had a glass. I, it, it it was a clear top tent, and they wanted a photo of the um, the couple, the first dance through the clear top tent. So I said, Yeah, okay. Well, you know what? It's just like you said. It's like you know, you you have enough confidence to know that you're going to do the best you possibly can. And when I left there, I was like, you know, I got home and I looked, and I was like, no, she loved it. I loved it. I said, okay, it was right. a little bit too noisy for me. Yes. Um, you know, because it was dark. It was getting dark. It was light. So. So my next question um, is we're kind of almost coming to a close here. So I have seen your career go from a photographer to you, you now doing video as well. Um, in fact, I woke up this morning, jumped on social media. The first thing I saw I, I mentioned was a, uh, a video of a humpback whale eating hundreds of thousands of fish that you were talking about earlier. Um, how important do you think it is for drone pilots who are photographers to add video and to start exploring with video production as well? And then how has it affected your career? Well, you know what? I think that's I think it's a really good question because I know a lot of people, a lot of drone pilots that focus either only on photography or only on video. And um, you know, I think it's really limiting to focus only on one. For me, I felt it was important to focus on photography first to really learn it. Um, I think video is a much bigger beast. Um, it's uh you know, it's it's a it's a much bigger beast, but but for me, it's you know, it's a major part of my revenue. So, um, you know, with me in the marine life, what I what I started doing is when I was flying every day, I would go out and um, just take a kind of weather shots. You know, whether it was big waves or it was uh, rye grass in the field just blowing around, or or snow or sunrise, and I would come back and I put it on Twitter, and um, you know, people started Weather Nation and like, you know, Weather Channel, they started to want my videos. And then I ended up, you know, tracking down which agency I wanted to work with. And um, then the marine life started coming. And now those videos, I mean, they, they get, they, they love that stuff. People, people, the news broadcasters, you know, I had meteorologists and, and newscasters all over the country and the world that were following and watching, you know, and now I know who to tag and who not to tag. And, and you know, I put, um, I just put up a shark video this morning. Um, so my agent took it, takes it, and then uh, they sell it to news sources because news sources won't buy it from me. But then what's happened is I was on Good Morning America. I was on Fox and Friends. I was on... Um, I was on ABC Nightly News about my art, you know, so it has built up. And it's really, that's how National Geographic found me for Shark Week footage. 
Hmm. Um, that was pretty cool. They came out to interview me, and and so so as it it just it just keeps building, you know, between the publications, and um, you know the news sources and the awards. It, it's getting bigger and bigger and and it snowballs you'll be fun it'll be funny because i mean it's not funny i shouldn't say that but you know when um when uh you know i have a viral video and i think i had i think i had four, 15 viral videos this year this season so far um which is great um but i actually make money on it so so it's not i, I don't say it goes viral because i'm not getting millions of views on my youtube channel it's going viral because you know a hundred different news outlets across the world have purchased it and uh, you know i had someone call me saying that it was airing in brazil uh, i've been called from brazil and all over for that kind of footage so so um so i'm really glad that you know i didn't just limit myself to just the photography mm -hmm. um and because the news sources don't really have they're very high standards in terms of cinematography. They don't. They actually don't want beautiful uh, footage. Um, well, they like sunrise, sunsets, all that stuff, anything related. But they would rather have it look raw and you know taken by like human being. You know, yeah, type. it needs to look jo journalistic. Production. There's a definite yeah, different not, look for journalism than yeah, there would be for cinema. Right. I, I see that. So. Then I wanted to move more into a more cinematic looking stuff. And, you know, so I've been focusing on that this year. I am definitely going to be shooting in D-Log. Got to shoot in D-Log. Got to shoot in D-Log. And you've got to color grade. And I would say, um, I wish I had, you know, really saw the difference earlier because I wasn't convinced. <laughs> I wasn't really convinced that it was the way to go. But, you know, anybody who's just starting out, I would say, you know, just learn it the right way the first time and uh, do okay. I mean, I think, you know, we've talked about this as well. I judge a lot of the competitions, which is actually how I found you in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and the only people that ever win the video portions of these competitions are the people who not only focused on uh, the video production and the editing and video and color grading, but also audio. You know, they're adding audio. sound effects. They're adding um, a dialogue, you know, not just one piece of music that just goes beginning to end with a bunch of aerial clips, you know, but something that truly actually soundtracks the work and, and it helps to accompany what's happening to tell the story. Because in video, the story is what's important, right? And, uh, you know, we color grade every clip of everything that comes through our studio. And people don't realize that. They're always like, wow, there's such vibrant colors that your drone captures. And they don't know that when you capture in D-Log or, you know, in a raw format, it actually looks super bland. But that's because that's where the data is in order for you to then do the work to bring it to what you want it to look like. It does. And I can tell you what, it's one of the reasons I think I, I, um, I hesitated is because um, over the ocean, it's hard to spot. You know the fish I, it's not super clear water here we're dealing with not you know uh, one or two days a, a summer we get great conditions but um you know i'm trying to spot i'm trying to follow a whale that dives down you know 15 feet under the water and i can't see it already and being in d-log makes it even harder um you know so it's just a matter of practice you know you find you know what works what doesn't work but the, definitely the d-log well, now it sounds like you're traveling to other places that have clearer waters and you're going to start getting different types of species of, of creatures and, uh, you know, expanding that portfolio as well, right? So excited. So excited. Yeah. yeah. So what's next for you? What's the future? Are you looking for newer drones? First of all, what drone are you flying and what have you been flying? I have got, well, I still have my Phantom, Phantom 4 Pro V2. Mm -hmm. I've got the uh, DJI Cine, the DJI Mavic 3. I've got the FPV, the Avada, and uh, the uh, Mini 4 Pro is on its way. And what's your go-to for art? Like, if you know that um, you're going to go out that day and you're going to capture some art, which one of those is the one drone? If you couldn't have, you have to choose just one, what would it be? The Mavic 3 Pro, DJI Mavic 3 Pro, because the zoom capabilities on the video are just blow you out of the water. I mean, it's better than the Cine, which came out the year before. Um, you know, and for me, I need to, I'd like to, I can see a whale spout a mile down the beach now. 
That's awesome. And I could literally watch the whale coming towards me, me saying, okay, well, it's going to get here in 10 minutes. It you know, keeps going. You can't predict them like that. But every now and then they just go back and forth. So, but. And then my last question is always, you know, what's what's the future look like? What do you have planned uh, upcoming? Uh, what are some things you really want to do, haven't done yet, that you're hoping to get done within the next year or two? Well, we're going to focus on bigger projects. Bigger projects. Um, you know, I, I'm like really kind of, I'm, I'm tired in terms of the video. I, I've made a huge collection of uh, video documenting the marine life, uh, you know, resurgence here. So, um, you know, we want to be the storyteller. You know, I'm tired of just putting, put, I'm tired of putting out, you know, 15 second clips. There's no real, you know, you have to take the clip. You have to find the clip, you have to pick out which clip and you have to edit it and you have to add a sound bite. But I'm looking to do something more meaningful, you know, and I really, you know, had to learn the basics of the video editing first. You know, so, um, yeah, I'd like to, you know, be uh, a little more involved with, uh, you know, the sharks that are, you know, the, there's a lot of shark tagging that's happening out here. Hmm. Um, I've dealt with a scientist from France. He came out to study fish. So I learned a lot about um, how to take video that will be useful to scientists. So. I, I found that. that pretty interesting. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, I mean, obviously, so. for those that live on the coasts, it's the best. You know, we we get the boats, we get the the marine life, and uh, we get the beautiful days. So, yeah. and the one thing I think I do, you know it was my last question, but I do want to make sure we're not underscoring because you've said it like six different ways without having to say it. The time of day and the lighting of the day is extremely important for your photography. I mean, you know, you mentioned that you like shadows, right? So that implies that there's a certain time of day to capture that. Um, you mentioned you like certain angles and certain, you know, certain things. So just last thing, if you could share with us, I mean, how important is the time of day and positioning of the sun, lighting and all of that with, with, with your art? Oh, it, it's, it's a major, you know, after composition, it's the lighting. You know, the lighting really dictates, um, you know, more of where I'm going and what's happening to. Um, so uh, different times of year, we have the sunrises. Sometimes the sun, you know, this time of year, the sun rises over the ocean. In the summer, it, uh, it rises behind us over the land, which makes a huge difference when you're flying the shoreline. You know, we're not, because we face south. Um, so that's a big thing. I also try to keep, and I keep that in mind because when shadows, when I see an interesting shadow and it's just not falling the way I want it, uh, I can say, well, I could come back in summer at a sunset at a golden hour and it'll be in the exact spot I want it to be in. You know, we can figure these things out in our head now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> You know, it takes a little while, right. but um, so yeah, and especially with the, the water, um, I like doing um, a lot of the waves. You get, um, you can get a shadow from the wave itself hmm. in, in the golden morning hours in the winter, but not in the summer. You're not going to ever get that shadow, see. you know, but, but I also need that sun to come up just enough to glare under the water so I can see what's down there. This no, is why we just all have to move to Hawaii or the Florida Keys, you know, <laughs> where you get the sunrise and the sunset every single day over the ocean. You just drive a little bit. You're on the other side of the island, right? <laughs> or, or you know, on our coast, obviously, in the West Coast in California here, we've got the sunsets, you know, and uh, it's a really amazing, amazing thing to have um, mm. the sun setting over the ocean, you know, all the time. So yeah. we, in fact, we did a shoot recently and then I'm, we're going to conclude this, but uh, where we were capturing a ship coming in from China under the Golden Gate Bridge in the Bay Area. And it was coming in in the morning, which was risky because it's cloudy almost every morning in San Francisco, and oh. we were flying from a boat. Um, but our client was East Coast, and he was really worried that we would have the shadow of the boat, you know, as it's coming in. And I said, no, we're, we're on the West Coast. The sun's going to be hitting it perfectly because, okay. you know, the sun's rising facing the, you know, the horizon yeah. of the ocean. The ship's coming in. And sure enough, it was like something out of like the Goonies. When at the end of that movie, when the ship appears behind the rock, and everyone's like, "Look at that pirate ship!" It, you know, the ship that we've been waiting for for you know six weeks. Uh, 
suddenly appeared behind the rock and came under the oh. bridge and it was lit perfectly Perfect. whereas you know on the other coast it would have been the opposite we wouldn't have had you know the, the front face we would have had to fly on, on the back of it but yeah. but is this the great thing about things. drones is we can put the drone wherever we want you know to get the sunny yeah, side yeah. but it was pretty yeah. epic to have you know the front lit boat with golden gate bridge behind it yeah. coming in so i imagine that that sounds amazing but yep light is a big factor and, and i always found especially in terms of video that it's you know golden hours are the best or early hours are the best um to light up that landscape especially here where the landscape is pretty flat um but uh and sometimes you know on a cloudy day then i might do something like a droneception because then I'm not going to have any shadow, and that's something you can do with no, you don't want shadow, you know. So there's, you know, there's all these different options. You have to think about it. Sometimes it's like I look outside and I'm like, what's going to happen? And those clouds are so awesome. By the time I get to where I want to be, there's no clouds. I haven't needed to do this in a while, but when I first started flying, I used to follow the sunsets. And you know, I live about 15 minutes from the beach, but if there's traffic, it might take me a half hour to 45. And I just, I mean, multiple days, I'm like staring at the sky going, don't set yet, I gotta get there, I'm almost there. And like rushing to throw the drone together while the sky is like bright red, blowing up, you know, with incredible sunset. You know, or there's those days I'm driving and I see the sun, I'm like, man, I wish I had the drone with me right now. And I was like flying for, you know, for photos instead of sitting in traffic. But uh, yeah, the lighting, you know, I agree with you 100%. Makes, makes a yeah. world of difference, it's gonna change everything. But I think the composition is first for me. I think, you know... And um, so I, I tried to take as few photos as possible, or, you know, as few, you know, but when you're doing video and you're doing marine life or you're doing surfers, you're doing objects that are moving, you just, you got to record the whole time. Yeah. Pretty close to, you know, I mean, you know, if the subject's there, you're going to record, you know, so it requires, uh, you know, a lot more, but you know, the more you fly, the more your eyes start to, to uh, assimilate to what you're seeing. So once you get over the fear of flying and you know how to comfortably control that drone, you can really start or, you know, to think about your framing and the composition. Right. You know, and, and then even when you find a composition you really like, you know, think about what it would look like, you know, in the afternoon or in the morning or, you know. I always think about, you know, what, but this, this was a cool covered in snow. We haven't had snow, but. Oh. That's funny. I look at the mountains and I feel that way from here, but the rest of where I live, no, it would not look good in snow at all. Not out here, <laughs> not where I am. Well, again, I thank you so much, Joanna, for, uh, for sharing some of your time with me and sharing some of your art uh, with me as well that we can share with the world. And uh, I just wish you continued success and continued luck. Um, keep on feeding the birds and uh, the whales <laughs> and just capturing those amazing moments um, when they're doing what they do best. Well, thanks for having me, Josh. And thanks for being an inspiration to so many people. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Appreciate it.